I'm going to be your segue to, to investing. So I am Amy Henry, the CEO of Unique Ventures. Um, essentially, we're, we're a hybrid accelerated venture builder. Um, our, our focus is we work with entrepreneurs. Um, we are backed by industry. We focus on mainly getting paid pilots, but we work through these companies through commercialization. It's about how do we more rapidly have technology accepted and adopted in the industry. So real quickly, we launched January of 2019. Um, our whole team is from the energy industry. Usually we, we all have about either 20 to 30 years of experience. Um, so what we focus on really is, is looking at the runway, you know, technology and innovation, you know, how do we get more industry participation at a much earlier stage, putting more skin in the game and, and working with us and partnering with us of de-risking and re-risking the technology, as well as getting more connections in the global wider ecosystem. So we work globally. So we, we have partnerships in Canada, Norway, um, kind of UK, uh, Israel, Southeast Asia. It's about how do we create more of these virtual bridges um, and with that connection point um, to our energy corridor in Houston. So, and, and then also when we look at energy uh, tech for technology, we look outside of the energy industry because a lot of this technology does come from outside the vertical of energy. And then connected to the capital side is how do we bring smarter capital in to these companies, which do have a very long runway, especially when we're talking about new energies and clean tech and sustainability um, and keep them a little bit more whole until they really need that a high level of capital. So, you know, we, we have to do all sorts of partnerships around the world and, and we continue to add to our international community because it does take a lot of people um, to help these companies. And so we're an open innovation uh, model. So we uh, work both with our alliance partners and outside of our alliance. So I'm just showing a snapshot. So when we have, uh, you know, certain companies and we get them to present in front of industry um, judges for pilots, you know, we have to bring a whole host of various players to the table from the, the energy, you know, vertical, as well as from private equity to VCs to angel groups, as well as governmental entities. So... I, I'm doing quick here is, is kind of, you know, these are kind of things that we see when we, we do health checks uh, on these startups on behalf of our alliance partners. And what I did here is to show what are the, some of the conversations we're actually even having with private equity, who's trying to invest in some of these companies, say at a series C and later. So you're, they, they're running into some of the same issues or the things that we see at an early stage, ranging from, you know, how do they, you know, de-risk some of these large product projects, still struggling with some, some large-scale engineering issues, um, EPC and, you know, impacts of outside forces, how they do site selection for some of these, these pilots. So it's, it's, it's not, you know, and so now we're being asked to, to kind of help with the, the other side of the equation too as well. So, you know, question I asked last year was, do, do we have enough energy startups? And so for 2022, it's the question of, do we have enough quality energy startups on the landscape? And so when we look at investing in, in some of these companies, it's really kind of a shifting landscape. And so last year we, we talked about, you know, kind of looking at, you know, there's been a decline in the seed market, you know, with the pandemic, there was a huge drop in, in some of that activity. But if I flip, you know, same thing, we're, we're having our companies look at non-traditional investors, which would be anywhere from CBCs, family offices, they could be some, some PE investors that have actually some of of them have pivoted to VC models as well as some some startups are raising their own funds through micro microfinancing SBA loans, but they're still very successful. Now, if I look quickly at 2021, we see, see that same trend where we see a huge influx of non-traditional investors to continue and our corporate VCs continue to make increased investments in some of these companies. Um, 
but what some of our concerns from from the energy standpoint is number one how do we keep some of these companies in the vertical but then how do we teach them how to be camels and not everyone trying to chase unicorns because we need a lot of technology companies there we don't need a few big ones but you know we kind of figured this would happen so when we're looking at 2021 we've got valuations really getting really really high for 2021 um, and we're having those valuations really climb. And with this, there was an increase even in the number of global uh, unicorns that were seen globally. So, you know, kind of if you look at the funding for some of these companies, about two thirds of the dollars that are invested um, are at a series C stage and later. So there's not as much capital for these companies at an early stage. There's been a slight increase in seed and angel investing, but that's not enough. And so we, we have to work at Unique on this equation of, of how do we get some of these pre-seed um, funds and investment dollars into these companies. I'm going to flip through that slide. And so I thought, if I pick our energy corridor, you know, they say, okay, Texas is maybe number four. But if you actually see it on the map, you can see um, how big of a gap there really is, right? And it's not just investment dollars, it's, it's about, you know, breeding those quality of, of startups as well. Um, because we, we personally, from our global scouting and those companies that we work with, we probably select maybe less than 10%. Um, we see fear and fear coming from Texas. Um, so what does that mean for Unique? Um, we've been asked because of all of these impacts on investing, um, we're asked to be taking on more project work with our energy companies. Um, maybe they've invested in these companies, they might be Series C um, to help them through these next phases. Um, we're being asked for these companies because valuations have gotten so high for to scout for them at a much earlier stage, even starting at a tier all three. Um, now we're having more energy companies coming with, up with their own ideas about how they would like to approach, you know, working with companies and accelerating them at a tier L6, 7 space. So that's always a great sign. So we've got more MOUs to operationalize this year. You know, we have to filter out there's more and more companies and there's a lot of noise in this space. And so we're having to slow it down a bit because we have to do a lot of forced collisions with some of these companies. Um, but still the big thing that I, I think that needs to happen is we've got a lot more collaboration that needs to be done within the investment community. So that's all I have to say, Mark. I, I, did I keep you on time? Yes, cooling, infrastructure, et cetera. Or we look to develop pure plate geothermal projects with co-location opportunities, utilizing either the heat, the electricity, or uh, one project we're looking at in Alberta and also in the U.S. Gulf Coast, uh, carbon sequestration opportunities through uh, multi-stage completions. We're actually looking, we're working right now with the University of Alberta here in Canada to develop a process uh, to, utilize, to combine carbon sequestration and geothermal energy to hopefully expand the range of conventional geothermal into unconventional resources like low temperature sedimentary basins. Uh, we are also looking to potentially partner with the University of Texas at Austin uh, on a similar project uh, in the Gulf Coast. So I'll try to get everybody back on track here by cutting my time a little bit short, but uh, yeah, we look to develop these utility grade projects, um, both in the waste heat to power and the geothermal space uh, with interested financing partners and uh, oil and gas uh, clients. So thanks very much for the time. And if anybody has questions, please, my email is always open, as is my LinkedIn. So hopefully we got you back on track a little bit there, Mark. Yeah, no worries. I, I actually um, allowed some, some time for uh, some flexibility, for some space there. So wonderful. Thank you so much. And so next, we'll be introducing uh, the buoyant Mr. Lafayette um, Herring with Sarah. Recording in progress. Uh, advancing all of our 
development opportunities and services agreements in North America. So uh, I want to say two basic points about the business model and then maybe two key elements takeaway that are kind of universal geothermal that I don't think are well understood today. So the Serafi business model is really two main legs or one, we have a technical solution set that Serafi has developed a single well closed loop solution for geothermal wells, which is considered advanced geothermal. And so there's no flow and no reservoir performance required for the well. We're basically just mining the heat from the bottom to the top with a closed intermittent fluid. And from that design basis, we're really creating a modular plug and play model to uh, install the units. Along with that, we've also developed proprietary technology around project management and uh, modeling for the whole package to work together from both the supply side through the demand and use of the power. So the business model that we have, uh, I think is the main point of differentiation here is that we're a client-based company. So we are not owner operator organic developers of projects. We're developing clientele. Those clients have assets that could be repurposed or developed for green, uh, for new green energy. So I look at the market segmentation, there's either the oil patch. So we're talking to oil and gas companies that have existing well stock and they're wondering what they can do with assets end of life. And we're screening those now to see if some of those existing assets could be repurposed for geothermal energy. The other market segment that we're starting to advance in Europe, it's already well established, less in North America, is we really wanna work in urban areas on decarbonization strategies to use heat directly into buildings to reduce power requirement from the grid and basically decarbonize urban areas, large buildings and spaces. So that's kind of second tier market segment for us in North America. Um, two, the two key points kind of about I think that underscore our business model and a really important is takeaways here is when we talk about utilizing existing assets and wells, obviously that's an existing asset that is could be extended the life of an asset. But the real value of the existing assets is it's giving us data today on how hot at certain depth. So we don't need to mobilize drilling services and anything to go find the heat. We're talking to people, they can tell us how hot it is today at the well site. And that saves enormous time and money kind of restructuring the front end risk profile of geothermal as it was conventional. And we might do a new drill instead of using an existing asset, but that existing asset could have told us how hot it was. And so we know what we're working with. The second element that I think is really important to understand for geothermal today is that there's an ability to monetize a whole range of heat. The highest heat resources will be used for electricity. And we're, we're going for low temperature geothermal with our closed loop well. So we're not at critical heat and flash. Um, however, uh, you can monetize below 100 degrees surface centigrade or say 180 degree is still a viable product. So we're looking at ways to take the heat that's available find a good use for it for either agriculture, heating and cooling a building, and if it's hot enough, electricity. But the way we refer to it is we're kind of monetizing a whole heat curve. And we need to do a lot of educating in the public for them to understand the value of that energy service. But it's not just electricity. There's really good value and important energy transition value in monetizing the heat, commercializing the heat. So well, right now, the, surfe the, um, the, the status... I'm sorry. Mark, I, I wanted to ask you a quick question, um, and if you could uh, wrap up in 60 seconds, it came from from Josh Turner. I'd rather do it now rather than at the end. So, Mark, wouldn't salt with high heat flow be the best place to put your wells into? And if you could ask answer that question in about 60 seconds, and then we'll move on to Amy Henry, just in just to be conscious of time. Did you hear the question? Mark. Mark, I think that was for, yeah, I think that was for the, right, the previous speaker from Canada. Oh, no worries. Yes, Mark Columbina from Terrapin. Oh, yeah, so, okay, yeah, we got it. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, super. Uh, apologies. So, high heat flow, salt, 
Yes, that would be a great place to put wells in. Um, unfortunately, that's not uh, where we have the resources right now. Uh, so we're kind of looking to develop lower temperature sedimentary basin, uh, conventional geothermal uh, geothermal wells. Super, thanks. And then back to you, Latvia. Sorry for the interruption. Oh, no worries. So I just one one final point. So right now, our status in, in North America is that we have clients under agreement that we're basically reviewing their portfolio of wells. And right now we're looking at several hundred thousand wells to screen where it's hot, where it's close to, to offtake opportunities. And right now we're in the status of raising our Series A um, equity. Um, just we don't need money to bring to the deals. We're just trying to build out the company's internal resource base. So, again, that's a that's a short story there. Thank you for your time.